Now, one of the more interesting aspects, and I think a unifying aspect as well, of being American is that we all came from someplace else. Even the Native Americans who have inhabited this continent for the past 15,000 years have been traced back to the Pleistocene period, where they migrated over a land bridge across the Bering Sea. We were all truly immigrants. By foot, by boat, by rail, by cart, we all came to America seeking freedom and opportunity. We brought with us our own sense of, of institutions, our language, and our customs to make us a little more comfortable here. Because despite the fact that America has always welcomed its doors to immigrants from around the world, fitting in has not always been easy. Each immigrant group has had to claw and scratch its way to respectability. And each immigrant group has chosen a distinctive path to gain that level of respectability within American society. And this month, we're going to look at one particular group. It's no more special than any other group. It's just the French Canadians chose a different way to try to fit into American culture. And it's something I think you'll be fascinated with. And also, we're going to learn a little bit about how the French Canadians are preserving their music today. So join us as we learn about the French Canadians here in the Blackstone Valley. Every ethnic group that came to the Blackstone Valley had a strategy on how to fit in. The French were no different. Based on the institutions, the values, the mores, and the supporting institutions of that particular culture, they all get, helped blend together to support that ethnic group as it moved into a foreign, and very often in America, a difficult environment. Now we're here with Norman Valancourt who is a professor at Johnson Wales College, head of the Humanities Department, who also happens to have a uh, French language program, Le Programme de Francais. Le Programme Francais, See, you have I, it. I always need a little hey, Not bad, not bad. Yeah. In, on W-O-O-N. We're here at I River Island Park to talk a little bit about the French experience here in the valley mm -hmm. and learn something about the impact they had here. Now, Norman, what kind of strategy did the French have? Well, if you're speaking of a strategy that they had, they had no strategy. When they came, is they came for jobs. I think basically, um, you know, the earliest uh, one settled here on 1818. So, of course, the whole area is already developed. And then uh, slowly from Canada, because problems existed in Canada, there wasn't enough food, uh, uh, farms were too small for the large families, you couldn't really keep piecing them out, and, and there were hard times. And so they came from Canada into the States, either sometimes invited to come by the industrialists who were building their mills, at other times, uh, it came in to find a better life for themselves. And so they began uh, trickling through all of New England and eventually, you know, more and more into Woonsocket. Now, when uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution hit with some kind of ferocity, I think, in New England, uh, there weren't enough people. And uh, the people from Europe, particularly the French, the Belgians, who built mills in the Woonsocket area or in the rest of the Blackstone Valley, thought it might be a great thing to go get Canadian workers. There were already some here, they needed more bodies. Uh, so they started inviting them to come to the States, particularly for work. And I think on the whole, the strategy for the Canadians was uh, to remain Canadian. I don't think that they had, um, you know, any ambition of becoming, uh, oh, to blend in, if you will. Uh, no ambition of becoming assimilated to the rest of the culture. They were Canadians and felt their identity very strongly and always still related with Canada perhaps more than they did with the States, at least in the earlier decades when they were here. Uh, when they came here, uh, their faith was very, very important. Their church was so important. And what they had to do is, since they were in large enough numbers, is create their own church, French church. They went to an English church. Most of the people who really seriously uh, wanted to practice religion couldn't understand anything. They were afraid their children would miss out on religion. Religion and culture for them and the language were one and the same. So they appealed to the bishops primarily in the States, but first to Canada if they would have priests to send here. 
Got to remember that the French in Canada lived in, on farms and they were far apart, okay? The neighborhoods were far apart. The heart of their civil life and their, their, their social life actually was the church. So when they came here, they wanted to maintain that kind of identity and that kind of grouping, and so they needed a church to do that. So the church was the heart of everything. So they built their social life on the church, their religious life on the church, uh, their cultural life on the church, because everything was organized with the help of the church. Yeah, they wanted to keep their oneness. I think that's, that's the thing. They wanted to be Canadians in the United States and kept their contact so closely with Canada. And that, that's the difference. Here, we were neighbors to Canada. They came from Ireland, they're far away from the homeland, they came away from Poland, from Germany, wherever, far away from the homeland. Here they had constant contact with the homeland, so they didn't really separate from it, they just, you know, transported it elsewhere. Supportive institutions are essential to the health stability, and growth of any immigrant community. The French here in the Valley were blessed with strong institutions. We're here today with Edgar Martel, former president of the Union St. Jean Baptiste Society, who's gonna tell us a little bit about those institutions to help support French culture here in the Blackstone Valley. This, to me, is an ideal, ideal for its people, its culture, its language, and its faith. Always don't separate them, you know, like a marriage. Immigrants kept coming further south, and finally, by 1900, there was approximately 200 of those societies. What were they? They would meet, because in those days, uh, no radio, no TV, no, so all they had was a newspaper, and. Uh, this was a meeting place where they, they could meet. And if a member of the parish society was to pass away, they'd pass the hat to help defray the expense of the uh, funeral. So by forming a mutual, it became like a life insurance company. Around 1916, they started to give scholarships. And to be a member at that time, you had to be French or French extraction, you had to be Catholic, and you had to be a citizen of the United States. If you were not a citizen of the United States, they would not accept you. Really? Yep. They, uh, people would come and we want to join, want to join. Well, we're going to have classes, you're going to become a citizen of the United States, then you can become uh, a member of the society. They had their school, but nuns. Half a day in French and half a day in English. But the irony of the whole thing was that the half a day in English, half of that was in, in French. <laughs> so you ended up with practically three quarters French and a, and a quarter English. But we got by. Some of the old timers when they, they speak, they worked in the cotton mills, they worked uh, 60 hours a week. You know? So all they had was Saturday afternoon and Sunday. So Saturday night, they went to dances and a lot of quadrilles in those days and the violin and the accordion, and then the guitar came in and all that. But they entertained themselves. And in summer, there was always some festivities in a park, in the city park. St. Jean the Baptist Day, which is June the 24th, you take in the province of Quebec, that's a national holiday. But over here, this society had a feast day. And we had a mammoth parade. And in our library, we have a lot of pictures of that. And then we'd go to Cass Park on Cass Avenue, mm -hmm. and picnics and whatever for the entire day. Love, treachery, and letting a friend handle your affairs of the heart are all the ingredients to a real steamy legend. Let's catch up with Ranger Bob Bellarose for our Blackstone moment. 
Bonjour, mes amis. I'm National Park Service Ranger Bob Belrose here with our Blackstone Moment. I'm standing in Cold Spring Park, located in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. There is a very interesting legend attached to this park with a French twist. A recent arrival to the town of Providence, founded by Roger Williams, is a Frenchman by the name of Robert Defoe, who has recently been banished by the colony of Plymouth for his unorthodox religious beliefs. Unfortunately, when he was banished from Plymouth, he also left behind his fiancée, whom he loved very dearly. The Indian chief or sachem would be the key to Robert Defoe's plan. Knowing the backwood trails completely and having free access to both the colony of Providence and Plymouth, he would be the ideal person sent to retrieve his long lost love. But the question was approaching the Indian chief. As the Indian wanted a rifle of his own, Defoe needed the Indian to retrieve his love. So a bargain was struck up. Defoe would give him the rifle in exchange for the sachem going back to the Plymouth colony and retrieving his fiancée. Upon arriving at the village perimeter, he met the sachem, where he immediately offered him the rifle and requested that his beloved be returned to him. The sachem said, no, you keep the rifle, I will keep the daughter of the pale race. Defoe was immediately heartbroken and shaken. Defoe's only chance was a last minute scheme. He requested to see his fiancée. He was escorted by the sachem to his wigwam, where immediately his beloved flew herself into his arms. The foe whispered into her ears, be awake around midnight and wait for the signal. She immediately knew in her heart what his plan was. The Indian chief left his wigwam and caught sight of the lovers fleeing in the distance. He let out a blood-curdling yell, he immediately flung his tomahawk with the aim of hitting the foe, and the tomahawk flew past and struck the girl in the back. She immediately crumpled to the ground with a scream. Defoe turned on his heels, seeing the enraged sachem running towards him, and fired his musket at point blank range, killing the chief instantly. While the braves were in hut pursuit, he located a small ravine in which he attempted to climb with his beloved. Halfway up the ravine, he came upon a cold spring, in which case he laid down his beloved and began to soothe her and comfort her from her wounds. She immediately began to plead with the foe to leave her, to save himself, figuring that the Indians would have mercy on a poor young girl. But he made a promise to her that fate would never again separate them and that their life and love would be forevermore. Turning around, he saw six braves coming out of the shadows with bows drawn. A shower of arrows flew towards them. An arrow pierced his heart, well, where he fell lifeless along the body of his beloved. As per his request, the sachem was buried under a mighty oak tree along the banks of the Blackstone River. To appease his spirits, the braves also buried alongside him the scalps of Robert Defoe and his fiancée. This has been National Park Service Ranger Bob Belrose with a Blackstone Moment. As you can see, the French Canadians in the valley had a unique approach to dealing with American society. Their sense of identity was strongly linked to their sense of faith and their language. And in today's hectic world, where fraternal organizations, religious ceremonies, and family moments are all relegated to a specific portion of our busy, hectic day, it's hard for us to fully comprehend the significance of language within the French Canadian community. And that's why I really have to tell you about Le Centenaire Movement, a truly traumatic affair that impacted the entire French Canadian community throughout New England, but more specifically here in Woonsocket. The sense of faith and the true impact of language is felt through this very, very difficult moment for the French. Let us hear Edgar Martel and Norman Valancourt discuss Le Centenaire and its impact on the French-Canadian community. Those families apart, friend, friendship for years. All of a sudden, they don't look at one another, they don't speak to one another. It was difficult. It was difficult. The hierarchy of the church here in the States said, well, we, we can't have division in the Catholic Church. A Catholic Church must give a unified image and a unified vision um, to all uh, who, who witness us. 
and primarily the Yankees. And many of them were afraid at that time. Some left the areas. Catholics were too numerous. They, they were afraid to stay with them, moved on in other parts of the country. And so the bishops at that time, um, you know, even before La Santinelle began, in the late uh, 19th century, were really intent on trying to have all the different cultures who were Catholic assimilate within the culture of this country uh, and have more unity uh, you know, among believers. So they, they would give a good example to all those who were non-Catholics, etc. So the hierarchy itself became predominated uh, by Irish clergymen because they were here earlier, let's face it, in, in groups anyway, and they were really intent on assimilation. The French resisted on a whole assimilation because we talked how close their culture and their language was to their faith. So they decided that, well, hey, we don't want to be assimilated. We're going to lose what we are. Or we're not going to be ourselves anymore. Our, our whole identity will have to be changed. And in order to build these new high schools, he had to accumulate funds from all the parishes. Now, uh, Woonsocket being an example here, because La Santinelle really existed in Woonsocket. It had an impact, a great impact outside of Woonsocket, but it existed in Woonsocket. Uh, these French Canadians had sacrificed, they had scraped their coins, uh, their dollars. They had built their own parish schools, they had built their, uh, you know, their own churches, their own convents, the house, the instructors who came from Canada or, or from the local population, those who became nuns and decided that they had control of those funds that was really their funds. And so many of them were reluctant to let the, the bishop siphon the money out of the parishes to build high schools which would be predominantly in the Providence area that would be all English speaking, not French. So one group says, if they're going to take our money, we're not going to pay any more of church views and this and that and uh, it really created a friction. How, how enmeshed was culture and faith. And now they're confronted in seeing, well, we have the bishop who represents religion, it's our faith, there are our religious leaders. Here we have our cultural values. Uh, one can't be without the other. And all of a sudden, they have to just break away. Those who, who followed that Sentinelist movement just had to break away in a sense and, and resist what the bishop was trying to do. Families suffered a great, great deal. I think um, particularly because it was a time when uh, these leaders were excommunicated. And you know what that means. In those days, excommunication was extremely serious. You're no longer a member of the Catholic Church. And the bishop had to go to that last resort and isolate those people. Now that, that's heart rendering. When your life is Catholic, French Catholic, let's put it that way, and that's heart rendering. I happened to be an altar boy when in my parish, which was St. Anne's here in Woonsocket, seven had been excommunicated and made their act of returning to the church. The pastor at that time was a, a nice gentleman, never made waste, never criticized the Sentinelist movement. And the leaders of the Sentinels were part of the parish, like Mr. Daniel, Mr. Amo, and a fellow named Mr. Cody. I don't, can't remember all the names. But anyway, there's an act. The ones that were excommunicated had a, a small piece of paper and they read the request to return to the church. And uh, the priest would take their paper and put his hand on their head. And when all seven were done, he told them to go back to their places in the pews in the front of the church. And his eulogy was, now the family is complete. That was it. And talking about preserving one's music and one's culture, I can't think of a better place to be than in a recording studio. We're fortunate to be down here in Pawtucket with Celebration Sound, who have allowed us to sneak in here just before Pendragon goes through one of the recording sessions. Now, one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to Pendragon 
and Conrad Defoe, who was a French-Canadian fiddle master, is because there's a unique re relationship between Conrad and Bob Druin. Bob and his apprentice, now you may think of him as a noted musician, which he is, but in this case, he's an apprentice, learning the tricks of the trade, the French-Canadian fiddle, thanks to the Rhode Island State Council of the Arts, the folk arts. And I think that one of the things we want to talk about is how do you preserve music in one's culture? Well, let's check in with Pendragon and see how it's done. The old break on it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Even one break on it. You know, Conrad, you uh, sound marvelous. Never, no one would ever have guessed you have a little arthritis in the shoulder, huh? Yeah. You would sound marvelous, folks. I really have to have to introduce you to everybody here because we were with our good friends from Pendragon and uh, their mentor, Conrad Depot. Yeah. Conrad, and this is Mary Lee Partington. We have Ken Lyon in the back, Bob Juan here, and Ken Rossetti, and uh, Russ, Russ Gazzetti. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good name change, though. I like that. <laughs> Anyhow, we're here to talk a little bit about French-Canadian music and uh, how you learned it and why it's important to preserve those musical, cultural heritage that we have. And, uh, Conrad, where did you learn to play the fiddle? In Canada, with my mother, she, she started to show me. I was about five, six years old, and... Uh, too small to hold a violin. <laughs> I guess. But finally, after a couple of years, you know, I started to grab a little bit, you know, and my grandfather used to be a violin player, a good violin player, and a jig at the same time, you know. Wow. And she's got two brothers, my uncle, he's two violin player, you know. So after the first time I played for a cabaret, you know, for the dance, I was yes. 12 years old. <laughs> yeah. Now, how'd you cook up with this guy, you know, when... Uh, well, I went to uh, see a, a party one Sunday afternoon, and uh, this guy touched me in the back. He said, uh, <laughs> he said I look for teacher. I said, I'm not a teacher. I said, I don't, I don't read music. I don't know nothing about reading music. So he asked me to teach. I said, no. I said, I'm going to give you a cassette, you know, with my music, and you can learn. So finally, he started to come every week. And <laughs> Here you are. Uh, it's not only been a great apprenticeship, and I've learned a lot of songs, which I've passed on to the everybody in the band, but uh, Conrad has become a, a great friend of mine as well. <laughs> he's, a, he's an incredible uh, man, and he's uh, lived a long life, and he has a lot of wisdom, and he likes to have a good time, and, and, and he's teaching me so many things, uh, more than just the fiddle tones. I like to keep going, you know, because now myself, I look for a violin player to replace me because my arm's bad sometimes. and. Uh, they play the, the quadrille, but they can't play all afternoon, you know? They uh, don't have just, the stamina. Just they don't, nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody! No, no, but I went to dance for 12 to years every Saturday night. In Berlin, in Sarkab, Manville, and quadrille every Saturday night for 12 years. Wow. 1969 to 1982, when I got sick, I got surgery for kidney, you know? Well, now I play once in a while, you know, and I don't want to study, but... I gotta play. <laughs> we <laughs> we gotta have him play. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's hear another song uh, where we yeah. got you all together. Okay, we'll do a, a waltz. The waltz. Yeah. Two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. 
know, it's very important. I mean, obviously you have a lot of fun, but uh, pride in your culture and pride in your music is one of those things that transcends us all. And mm -hmm. I think that here in the Blackstone Valley, where we have for a long time not appreciated the wonderful cultures and the stories and the songs we have, it's important to realize there are people like Conrad and Pendragon mm -hmm. who go out of their way to preserve those songs and make us all aware of the great music that is being made and the, the culture and the heritage that has lived here for hundreds of years. So I think you're all to be applauded, and uh, I'm just real glad that here along the Blackstone has been able to hook up with you because, folks, as you know, all the music we do in along the Blackstone is from Pendragon, and they've been nice yeah. enough to let us do that. Oh, yeah. So uh, I it's think been a, it's been a real pleasure to share it with you, and I think part of the interesting thing about the French Canadian music is that it's provided such a wonderful opportunity for outreach. Um, my background is is Irish and English. Ken's is Scottish. Um, Russ. Is, uh, Russ doesn't have any background. He has no background. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's made for a wonderful outreach right within the community mm -hmm. to be able to share in this music. So um, we'd like to thank you a whole lot. Thank you, Conrad. Yes, yes we, owe, we owe a debt to the rememberers for folk culture. And Conrad is a most revered rememberer, his stories and his songs. That's right. It's, uh, That's it's beyond importance. Ada, you're absolutely right. I think that the preservation of music as a part of culture is just incredibly important. That today in our fast-paced lives, we often forget that. And mm -hmm. I think it's uh, really great what you're all doing. Conrad, um, continue to play. Let's oh, yeah. do uh, <laughs> your two in one. Two in one. Survivants, the French Canadian strategy to maintain their heritage, their culture, and their language. Just another one of the great stories we find along the Blackstone. But here in the city of Woonsocket, the story of the French continues. We happen to be here at the Falls Yarn Mill, not the same ambience as we'd find at the Union St. Jean the Baptist boardroom, because as you can see, this mill needs a lot of work. But thanks to a large cooperative effort, between Rhode Island DEM, the Rhode Island Historical Society, the Woonsocket Industrial Development Corporation, the City of Woonsocket, and the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, this old mill building is going to turn into a living museum, a museum that's going to tell the story of the immigrants, particularly the French, that came to the valley to work and to bring their families. It's a great story. And as we listen to that French-Canadian film music, it sounds really good, doesn't it? Just remember, Au revoir, mes amis. Jusqu'à la prochaine émission dans le Valley. Just a little bit, but that's yeah. part of the fun. <laughs>